Hello, everyone. I wish I could be there uh, in person, but uh, I'm at least uh, very happy to be able to make a, a contribution uh, at a distance. I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for their willingness to uh, invite me to uh, and to uh, have me present uh, through video. Um, in this segment of my presentation, I'm going to give an overview of what I see as some of the main issues in uh, teaching through multiple languages at the elementary school and, and beyond. Uh, then I'll go into more detail in two subsequent presentations. When we look at the research that's been carried out uh, in bilingual education and multilingual education, uh, what we see uh, over the last 10, 15 years is an accumulation of evidence that's become almost overwhelming. Um, we, if we look at, for example, some of the books that have been published recently, uh, you see on the screen two recent books. Um, one of them is Multilingual Education for Social Justice, uh, which is edited by Ajit Mohanty, Minati Panda, Robert Philipson, and Tovas Gutnab Kangas. Uh, and the other, Language Issues in Comparative Education, edited by Carl Benson and uh, Kimo Kosonen. Uh, these two books together just highlight the fact that there is research going on in multiple contexts around the world documenting the uh, effects of bilingual education in a variety of different uh, contexts and highlighting the fact that these effects are consistent across very different socio sociological and sociolinguistic contexts. So when we look at what we know and what should inform policymakers, I think we've reached a tipping point where the uh, amount of research has accumulated uh, such that it's not possible to credibly deny the legitimacy of multilingual education for minority and marginalized group students. Um, when we look at uh, some of the principles that have come out from this research, there are uh, several things to keep in mind. As the title of my presentation uh, suggests, and it's the same title as in the book edited by Ajit Mohanty and, and colleagues, namely Multilingual, Multilingual Education for Social Justice, uh, we're not talking only about medium of instruction here. Uh, educational effectiveness, effectiveness is not simply a matter of including students' first language as a medium of instruction. It is also very much a matter of reversing historical patterns of social injustice. So there's a psycholinguistic element, but there's also a sociological element. And we have, I think, uh, a lot of research pointing in the directions of what effective schooling for language minority students uh, might look like. In, the, in my chapter in the book, edited by Ajit uh, and colleagues, um, I try to articulate three core non-negotiable principles that will underlie any program that aspires to be effective. One of these uh, principles is strong and effective promotion of fluency and literacy in both languages. Uh, so what we're looking at is not just some transi transitional use of students' first language and then a rapid transition into the dominant languages. Uh, we're looking ideally at continuing to promote literacy uh, in fluency and literacy in the children's first language and in the dominant language for as long as possible. Now, there may be constraints in terms of how long we can do that in terms of availability of teachers, uh, availability of curriculum materials, but that certainly is the goal. And the research that's out there suggests that the longer students are in a bilingual or multilingual program, the better they do in both languages. A second principle that's non-negotiable is the centrality of sustained literacy engagement in both languages. Now, literacy here means more than just reading and writing. Literacy is being used in a broad sense as the oral and written repository of a community's cultural knowledge. So there, uh, when uh, students are listening to stories that come from their culture, from their community, that's a form of literacy that we're talking about. But when we look at the reasons why a focus on literacy is important, uh, the language that goes beyond the here and now, the language uh, that is the language of subject matter in education, that's the language of discussing world affairs, that discussing things that are beyond just here and now, is language that typically is quite different, both in vocabulary and often in grammatical structure uh, and discourse conventions from everyday conversational language. And we find that language predominantly in printed text. 
Essentially, we find it in two places. We find it in classrooms and we find it in printed texts. So if students are not reading extensively, they're not getting access to that language. So uh, when we look at multilingual education, it's a matter of focusing on uh, the need to develop literacy materials in students' first language if they're not there already, and also getting students involved in reading as extensively as possible in that language as well as the dominant languages of the, of the school and society. And then a third principle focuses more on the sociological dimensions of uh, education for marginalized group students or linguistic minorities. We're talking about empowerment, uh, and I'll define empowerment in a moment. But um, d empowerment is uh, a term that has been used and misused, and sometimes it uh, has lost all meaning in the, in, and, and become vacuous because it's been used in ways that do not effectively tie it to power relations in, in the society. The way I'm trying to use the term is directly related to the historical and current patterns of power relations in the society. And empowerment can be defined as the collaborative creation of power. Um, and power is being emphasized because when we look at social justice and social injustice, we're talking about power relations in the society. Um, and so if we look at what we mean by empowerment, um, I make a distinction between two very common uses of the term power. If you look up any typical dictionary, you'll find these two uses. Uh, one use is what I call coercive relations of power, where power is being uh, defined as the exercise of power by a dominant group or individual or country to the detriment of a subordinated individual group or country. This is the notion of having power over others or exercising power over others. And unfortunately, this is all too common in human relations and, uh, and world affairs. So this is what I mean by coercive relations of power. Power is seen as something that's fixed, uh, that uh, there's a fixed quantity of power. And if one individual or one group gets more of that fixed quantity, then less is left for others. Um, so that's one meaning of power that you'll find in any decent dictionary. A second meaning, however, is the notion of being enabled or having power to do more than you could before. And um, this is what I'm calling collaborative relations of power. And collaborative relations of power operate on the assumption that power is not a fixed uh, quantity, uh, a fixed predetermined quantity, but rather can be generated in interpersonal and intergroup relations. So participants in the relationship are empowered through their collaboration such that each is more affirmed in his or her identity and has a greater sense of efficacy uh, in terms of what they can do with their life or social situation. And this is the notion of generating power with others or uh, uh, being empowered uh, to do things. So as I said, empowerment in the way I'm using it can be defined very simply as the collaborative creation of power. And what this means in classrooms uh, is that teachers have got to be focusing on pedagogy that communicates strong, affirming messages in relation to students' uh, uh, personal worth, in relation to their academic potential, uh, and in relation to um, what they can do uh, with their lives. So when we look at what empowerment means uh, in the classroom, um, what we're talking about is uh, instruction that challenges coercive relations of power in the wider society, that is communicating messages to students that affirm their value, their uh, worthwhileness as individuals and their academic potential. So any educational reform that seeks to close the achievement gap between students from dominant and marginalized communities will only be effective to the extent that it challenges the operation of coercive relations of power in the school and classroom. And so it's much more than just transmitting a curriculum. We're talking about a process of negotiating identities. Um, and so a fundamental principle that emerges from this to keep in mind when we think of what our identities as educators in classrooms, in multilingual classrooms might be, is that if we want students, we want, if we want our students to emerge from schooling after 12 years or, or however long they are in school, if we want them to emerge as intelligent, imaginative, and linguistically talented, then we need to treat them as intelligent, imaginative, and linguistically talented from the first day they arrive in school. And so when we look at this principle, 
Uh, we're talking about sociological dimensions of schooling. We're talking about how our, our instruction communicates a very different message to students and communities than has historically been communicated to them. And clearly, putting students' first language into the school is part of that, but it's not sufficient by itself. We have to focus both on the psycholinguistic dimensions uh, of teaching through the first language and developing literacy through both languages, but also on the sociological dimensions. Both are equally important, and I'll elaborate on uh, on these points uh, in subsequent presentations. Thank you.